Welcome to the Social Mission Revolution. Each week we explore some of the greatest undertold stories of businesses and everyday people who are making their ultimate impact in the world through social mission. This is Social Mission Revolution and this is your host, Andrea Putting. Welcome to another episode of the Social Mission Revolution. And I'm here today with Helena McDonald. And Helena has a very interesting social mission that she's on. And I'd like to introduce her to you and have her just tell us a little bit about what she does that got her into a social mission, maybe to start with. Well, it has been a journey of passion. And I have always been a person that wanted to help people. It's taken me a while to work out how to actually position myself. But I've ended up using my knowledge and my creativity to launch a foundation based in the USA, housing and helping veterans of all manners of wars and all manners of anything to do with their service, helping the rehabilitation process of housing them, giving them a small budget to create their own business and helping guide them there, as well as helping them manage their own budgeting and financial IQ. That about sums it up. That sums it up. And you're also doing a little bit of property development over in the US as well, aren't you? Not so much development, but just property in general of buying and selling and and putting roofs over their heads. That's the the main mission. Mm. Okay. So let's, I'm really fascinated by some things with this, which we'll talk a little bit about, but. First of all, let's have the question that I love to ask people. If there was one thing for you to fight for, what would it be? It would be my veterans because I don't think that there's enough people out there that think that they can make any monumentous changes to any government policy to be able to help these people. And I think they deserve the respect to be helped. Yeah. What, and what really fascin- really fascinates me because one thing, you're an Australian, living in Australia, but you have this passion to help the, the veterans in the US. So how does that really come about that you have that? I mean, a I lot s- of people I have s- social missions from other countries, but this one particularly is interesting. I suppose... In my realisation of the veterans that are in Australia, as far as I was concerned and the research that I had done, our government looks after them pretty well. They, we have an incredible VA hospital system for rehabilitation, physical as well as mental. We have a pretty good setup for housing. To my knowledge, when you put the numbers together, there is definitely a lot less housing homeless in Australia than what there is in the States. There is a lot less uh, medical benefits for things that are out of the norm in the States as opposed to here. Again, the hospitals and medical systems take over. In the States, if it's not something that's physically broken, but they're broken inside, they're kind of like shelved. Mm. And I think that is something that's that's in the, the mainstream that the VA and medical benefits don't cover things like PTSD and any other mental disorders. I would not even start to imagine, I think the noise would get me to start off with, 
and that would be enough to absolutely shoot me in the foot. I don't know how they do it. There's girls over there as well as boys. It's not just boys. I know that they try and keep the girls out of the front line. But I think being a girl too, you get to see that from both sides of the fence, sort of like should you be protected or shouldn't you? And as far as I'm concerned, if they're shooting exactly what the boys are shooting, they sort of have that right to be there. But again, that's just my opinion. Uh, as far as coming back home, there is probably a lot more rehabilitation needed mentally for the girls that come back because it's assumed that they go straight back into their role as mum and parent and auntie and uncle and daughter. And I think there's a lot of things that get in the road of that. And there's a lot of counselling that is just not provided over there from what I could see. And that's where I want to make a difference. And where, where did your passion come from to, to help veterans? I mean, there's got to be a story there somewhere. There's got to be something that sparked that as being an important area for you to work in. Well, it probably started off with the fact that my husband of nearly 14 years has, has always used the service side of things. His brother actually did two tours in the SAS in Vietnam. And then when he came back, he did a lot of training because they found out that he had an incredible skill that was a skill set that apparently was needed to be um, trained upon. We also have a lot to do with Phillip Island. So going down to the Veterans Museum was something that I just got absolutely blown away with, seeing some of the things and some of the conditions that these guys were, were fighting in and day in, day out. Uh, I was absolutely stunned at the foxholes that were in the Vietnam War especially. So the Vietnam War is really all I can kind of talk on. And my hips wouldn't even fit through it. And I don't really have big hips. Yeah, so funny. I can't even imagine the size of these guys going down these foxholes with guns and backpacks and going into, I have no idea what's down there. And that must just play with your head every day. I, I wouldn't even start to imagine. It's but true. again, um, sort of as you asked the question, and I've always been involved with sort of the mystery of war because I don't understand it. I'm 54 and every time a war starts, we're pretty isolated in Australia, but we're always one of the first ones to put our hands up. Again, the ratio of people in the US, I suppose, we'll compare it to, is <laughs> probably less, like we're less in Australia than the amount of troops that were sent in the States. But I suppose when you actually find out about the wars of sort of like who started them, why are they started, is it religious, is it somebody's just sitting there on their high horse going, I'm going to take over the world, as per what Hitler did from what I can, Im can imagine from my research. But I just don't get war all around. So no. I suppose I'm probably a peaceful person in the fact that if I can help put their world back to where it was before they left, that's a job well done. Yeah, because there really is that it breaks people completely, doesn't it, with with going to war. I am very much a pacifist. I've always been a pacifist, but it doesn't mean I don't support those people who who have been through. I can I can only think of terrorised as being the being the result, and I know that that when 
the rate of suicides of returned service people is really high because they, it is so hard for them to put their lives back together. And they have to sort of admit to themselves that to get them into that mindset to start off with, they really are brainwashed into you will do things this way, this way, this way. The, the food will be on the plate at X time, three times a day. You will be on parade at X time. So the total brainwashing back, the reversal is so hard to accept when you've been in that discipline and especially when you're talking about guys that have been, and I say guys, men and guys and girls, mm -hmm, but yeah. take that personally. Um, the guys that have been in there for 20 or 30 years that have gone in straight from, I think they're allowed to enlist in at 17, but they're not allowed to do anything active until they're 18. So basically some of these kids are enlisting at 18. They've not had any real life experiences. Some of them haven't even had girlfriends. They've still been living at home. So the exposure to what they're seeing as a real world, they would not know any different. And hence the fact that these people are, are probably enlisted and stay in the services because they're so scared to come out to the real world. They don't know what it is. It's and that's, that's another enough. fragment as well. Yeah. Yeah, it must be really difficult for them when they've had that kind of, that's been their whole world to then find a way of living else otherwise. And many of them have to because they're no longer fit for service. And you've also got to remember the impact of the buddy system. Now, the buddy system is great. We're brought up at, like that in Australian schools that the grade sixes sort of look after the, the new ones, the preppies and, and things like that. But when you're in a unit position, your best buddy is the guy that's on your shoulder and he's always on your shoulder. Mm. So virtually regardless of whether you like that person or not, what happens to you emotionally when that person's not there anymore? Yeah. You've, you've had no exposure to death or if you have had, it's been a relative or and it's probably been a grandma or a grandpa or a great uncle or maybe there's been a death in the family by an accident or something like that. But it's it's not been by somebody that's been by your side twenty four seven. Yeah, whose role it is to keep keep you safe. And your role is to so keep them safe. And you yeah. haven't done you haven't fulfilled that keeping them safe would be on the back of their mind as well. Mm. Yeah. Can you imagine living with that every day? I couldn't. No. No, it's a, it's a tough one and I think that they really do. It's a really hard thing for them to come home to and to have to deal with life. Yeah. yeah. That's why part of my wish of putting 2,000 veterans in apartment buildings and I think everybody understands in the world of apartment buildings, so regardless of where this goes, what I aim to do is they can have the choice of having a one-bedroom or a two-bedroom. They can buddy up if they want. They can be by themselves if they want. But there will always be a place that is a communal area. So... I'm, I'm doing this with the vision that they have the choice of being by themselves or the choice of being communal. So if these guys are quite social when they get out, a lot of the times when you end up and they are in a homeless position or they are in a situation that's just really not great, um, they've got the support there of others. Even if they're not other vets, they're still other people. And the heartbeats count. They yeah. don't matter if it's 
if it is military or if it's just the cleaner, just somebody to talk to. Yeah, and knowing uh, that they're surrounded by people who are going to be on the watch for them yeah. as well, give them that sense of belonging again. And the other thing that I want to achieve with the, the whole concept is to be able to offer a small, very small amount of money for anybody that has any passion to create their own business, whether it's uh, to pay for some tuition to get them into that business and start them rolling. Small business loans and small business, you have to go through so many hoops and I just don't agree with those hoops. Um, people should be given a chance, especially in the position that they've been in. And, yeah, they've put their lives on the line. I think they should be cut just a little bit of slack. Yeah. Again, my opinion. <laughs> and, and it's fair enough. They have too many people. They're, they've gone believing that they're, they're doing this for their country and they come home and the country does nothing in return for them yeah. or not enough. So how are you going about this foundation? How are you ha making this happen? That I can't actually keep you on the same page, but if you'd like to revisit me in three months' time, <laughs> I'll have some more answers for you. No, I do have a few plans. I have a goal of 2,000 doors in apartment buildings. So that's basically 2,000 units. Yeah. And I also have a goal of 500 single families. Now, another fallout of the wars is so many families get separated, whether it's through their own fault or it's through family's fault or they've had to move away for treatment, or whatever the case may be. I'd like to give people as many chances as try to put the family unit back together because I think that's where people get better themselves as far as needing help. And I think if the families are there together, uh, one of our other prerequisites before families moved in was if they were needing any facilities like the ramps for wheelchairs or amputees or anything like that, it would all be there ready for them just to walk into. So it was something that wasn't going to be scary. It was something that was straight out of their rehabilitation rooms. A lot of consulting would be with physiotherapists and stuff like that and they would be brought in on the team to go over these houses and go, right, well, this isn't going to work, but this isn't going to work, right, we'll fix that. So it should be a nice, smooth process for everybody to be there. It's going to mean a bit of upheaval sometimes, but if we can find houses that are close to everything, like where the kids are at the moment with school or whatever the case may be, and maybe having to move into state or something like that, as long as they're together, I think that would be a good enough grounding. Where I'm getting the financial support from is basically commercial lenders for a big portion, meaning 75 to 80%. And now here's a bit of a catch-22. In Australia, we call it superannuation, which mm -hmm. is slash self-managed superannuation funds. In the States, it's called either a 401k or a self-directed IRA. We will be using a portion of that money to basically get our feet in the door. The rents, the veterans will be paying rent, but it will not be anything out of their pocket because wherever they live, the government pay the bill anyway. It's called a Section 8, yeah. which is basically the same as our low-income earners stuff. Uh, stuff's really good, Helena. That's all right. Uh, benefits. <laughs> benefit. There we go, benefits. Yeah, benefits. Can edit that benefits. Yeah. So, um, it's so, so nothing's coming out of their pocket. Whatever they're entitled to on their pension or whatever it is that they get, 
they will be basically getting food back. So it's making the most out of their benefits that they have to start with and then having, but then providing, getting helping and actually finding those facilities and yeah. doing all that. Um, the the foundation them. was actually founded in Phoenix and I sort of fell in love with Arizona, which was good because 12 months before it happened, Arizona was just never on my radar. It was, it was a block of sand. <laughs> yeah. But I, I started having, I, I suppose I started researching PTSD and different ways to deal with that and people that had had success with a lot of things. Uh, and in just out of Phoenix, I could never tell you whether it was north, south, east or west, there is actually two businesses that have extremely high success rates with helping these guys out with PTSD. And the rest of the puzzle just seemed to fall into place. And so I was like, okay, Arizona's the base. We'll start from there and we can use those benefits because it's not having it's not having to put the veterans through anything extra over and above that that would be stressful for them. There's, they're having enough issues dealing with day-to-day -day life. They don't need the 300-page application for the VA homework. Mm. They don't need the 1,000-page application to, to get a pen. That's exaggerated, I know. <laughs> but some of, the, some of the processes you should, should just be able to walk out and just go, I'll handle it. Yeah. You just get better. Yeah. And, and that's where I want to go. Yeah. It's a really admirable thing that you're doing. It really, I can really see the purpose and the passion that you've got going on here with it and really understanding that here are some people who, are, who don't deserve to be left on the street, don't deserve to be forgotten. They need to be given those opportunities and, and just taken care of. Well, the last stat that I was actually given, and it was only about six months ago, when I said of what I wanted to do over the next five years, and he turned around and said, at this particular point of time, there is actually 40,000 nationwide homeless veterans. Wow. And I sort of went, wow. And that's, and yes, you can coin that. It's July 2019. And I'm pretty sure that stat was given to me in January 19. So they're pretty up-to-date stats. Yeah. So that's a lot of people. Yeah. It must be so demoralised. Demoralising. Demoralising yeah. for them to come yeah. home, feel as though they're doing something, something important for their country and then just find themselves on the streets. I just cannot comprehend how that would feel. And the other thing that you also have to look at is the relationships that were already put into concrete before people went away. Now, if these guys are living in little country towns and little country towns are 20,000 people where the kids have grown up, they've gone through, they've played football, they've done this, they've done that. Uh, they may have had a girlfriend, don't know. But... All of a sudden, their friends haven't gone and they've gone. And mm. that is a really hard change to accept. And that's why I think a lot of people can't handle going back into an environment because they've changed and they don't see that anybody else has. And again, messing with your head will that. Yeah. Yeah, it would. Yeah, I just can't comprehend how that would be, how that would feel to people. Yes. So. Well, I do thank you for your time, Andrea, and <laughs> I do thank you for your compliment on my passion because when I do start talking about it, it does definitely fire me up. Uh, the board of directors that I've actually picked with me, I have three left, and they are all actually veterans or. One is actually a, 
what does she call herself? Uh, well, an army, an army brat is what her three <laughs> children are. Yep. She's an army wife, and he's due out next May, which is May twenty twenty, and he literally has twenty years service. So they have moved around. Uh, they've actually bought a house this time. Other than that, they've been renting their yeah. whole lives because they keep moving. He's he's pretty high up the food chain now, but he knows that that things are going to change big time when he doesn't have to get up at 6 a.m., go for the run, go for the 20-minute drive. So there's sort of headspaces everywhere that need help from from the very beginning to the very end. And they're all in danger when it comes to, to any form of support. And as I said, even getting them out of any financial difficulties that they may have had, uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of people out there that still prey on the people that are in the service because they know that they're there for the next three years and, oh, yes, you can go buy a car and hire purchase this and... And sort of all of a sudden your very small pay packet of like $1,400 a month, which I think is the bottom line basically. I mean, you don't really need much when you've got three meals coming to you and accommodation paid for. Yep. Um, but then they go to retire 10 or 15 years later and they're still retiring on sort of like $4,000, but their credit's absolutely ruined because... They've had to go away and payments have stopped and things like that. And they're up against a brick wall when it comes to it's great to say, yeah, here's your VA loan. But if you've got no concept of how to manage that and manage your money, that's a really hard task. And that's something that I've heard from nearly all servicemen is they're not taught any financial education whatsoever. Yeah, that's hard. They're not taught life skills for the normal life society skills, that, exactly. that we live in. Yep. So they come back to a completely foreign world. Mm. And and as technology changes, I mean, I don't know about you, but remembering 10 years ago, we didn't have the access to mobile phones. Yep. We didn't have computers in general. And that's only a 10-year span. What about these guys that have been inside for, for 20 years? Yeah. yeah, they've had their own technological changes, but I don't think they've been exposed to a lot of life changes that have happened in that time. Mm. It's been really yeah. eye-opening talking to you, Alina, about all this. It really has been. makes you stop and think about, about how it would be for people to be mm -hmm. dealing with this. So would well, you... I'd like... Sorry. Would you have any advice for anyone who was who was looking at setting up some kind of social mission foundation or, or just anything to do with what you talk about? Just be led by your passion. Mm. If, if it really burns you, and I'm sitting here and I can feel goosebumps on my hands. Yeah. I'm not nervous anymore. I'm just really pumped that I can do this. And if anyone does get in my way and anyone does give me grief... Don't get in Helena's one, way. You know, I have one person on my side and that's Karma. You stuff me and yeah. Karma will bite you and that's all I have for. I don't need to do any damage to people. No. When I, as I say, I'm 54 and people have got to me in younger years and I have heard some really horror stories. So, yes, come a bite. I really <laughs> believe it. So is there anything else you'd like to add before we close off? Other than just to say thank you again for inviting me on. Um, thank you for your appreciation and the fact that you did learn some stuff. And I just can't wait to get over there and start knocking on some doors. Okay. And I'll put a link to your foundation so people can Thanks. find out more about that and how they can, if they want to help or want to be involved in something like that, they can have a chat with you and find out more information. That's not a problem. I will give that to you in Messenger. Great. So thank you very much, Lena. It's been a real pleasure to learn more about what you're doing. 
Thank you. Um, this has been another episode of Social Mission Revolution, and I'll be back next week with another Social Mission Revolutionist. Okay. This has been the Social Mission Revolution with Andrea Putting. Join me again next week when we'll speak to another Social Mission Revolutionist who will inspire you on your journey to making your ultimate impact on the world. <laughs>